It's Saturday evening in Tokyo, and a group of young men are sitting around watching a baseball match. Nothing strange in that, except that the fact that these men have made it here at all is extraordinary. I'm Claudia Hammond, and in The Truth About Mental Health from the BBC, I'm investigating a rather mysterious condition that originated in Japan and could be spreading to other societies. Hikikomori is the name given to the young people, mostly men and often eldest sons, who retreat from life, refusing to go to school, cutting themselves off from their friends, and sometimes not leaving their rooms for years or even decades at a time. On average, it starts at the age of 15, often to very bright students from well-off families. It affects more than 700,000 young people in Japan, and maybe even as many as a million. In this programme, I'll be asking why this is happening in Japan and how society shapes our mental health. I'm starting on a cold Saturday evening in a Tokyo side street. Although it's freezing out here, where I'm about to go is warm and welcoming, especially if you are hikikomori. This is a youth club run by a charity called KHJ, and it's a first step and a big step for those trying to return to society. There are lots of these clubs, and they're known as Ibasho, which means the place where you can be yourself. I'm going to visit the Ibasho room later, but for now I'm shown into a small room where over the course of the next few hours I meet a succession of young men, all with subtly different stories. Toshi, Matsu and Hide, for whom it all began when he found it difficult to go to school. Because I stopped going to school, that became a pressure for me. And I started blaming myself. And my parents also blamed me for not going to school. Then, gradually, I became afraid to go out and fearful of meeting people. And then... I couldn't get out of my house. And would you go out at all, or did you spend all your time in your room? When I was in my worst condition, I couldn't get out of the house at all. I could get out of my room, but not the house. What did you spend your days and nights doing? What was a typical 24 hours like? Basically, I didn't want to see my parents. So I had my daytime and nighttime upside down. So I slept during the day and woke up in the evening toward the night. I had me separately from my parents, and at night I watched TV, looked at the internet, and sometimes read books. Then when it became light, after sunrise, I went to bed to sleep. And when you were retiring to your room, do you think you were doing that because you were feeling angry or feeling sad or upset or or just desperate not to go out? Maybe you don't think of it as a particular emotion? Mm, I had all of the feeling you described, <clears throat> the desire to go outside and anger towards society and my parents, sadness about having this condition, fear about what would happen in the future, and jealousy towards the people who are leading a normal life. I thought, why is it only me who is experiencing this? I was really blaming everything on society. And I had all the different types of negative emotions inside me. The reason was that I couldn't agree with my parents about my career or going to university. I was very well mentally, but um, my parents pushed me the way I didn't want to go. I've never been depressed or anything. What did you want to do and what did your parents want you to do that was different? My father is an artist and he runs his own business. He wanted me to do the same, but I wanted to be a salary man and work for a company doing computer programming. But my father said that in the future there won't be a society like that. So don't become a salary man. And what was daily life like? Can you describe it? At that time, I was having fights with my family every day, especially with my younger brother, because he was doing whatever he wanted to do. But as the first son, I did not have that choice. I became violent, and I had to live separately from my family. 
あ、私はそれを思い出しています。私はそれを思い出しています。私はそれを思い出しています。私はそれを思い出しています。私はそれを思い出しています。私はそれを思い出しています。私はそれを思い出しています。私はそれを思い出しています。私はそれを思い出し
With all these types of disorders, when the young people have difficulty in adjusting to society, especially in Japan, the style of hikikomori, withdrawing from society, is the most common. The tendency is very strong. In Japan, when young people fail to participate in society, maybe the families accept the situation. So, you're right. There are lots of conditions, symptoms and disorders that show the condition of hikikomori. Perhaps in the other countries, they are more likely to become homeless. What happens if people don't recover? Right now, the average age of hikikomori is um, 32 years old, while before it was 21, an increase of 11 years. I think there are two reasons for this. One, it's simply that the age is going up. In the past, there were more cases that started as students at school. However, now there are more cases where people get jobs and leave the company and become hikikomori. The second reason is that some people become hikikomori and stay that way. In extreme cases, even though the parents are over 80 years old and they are in their 50s and 60s, this is a very serious problem from now on. Although there are some cases of hikikomori in South Korea and Italy, and possibly other countries if you start to look, it's Japan where it's really taken hold. Some believe 1% of the population is affected. So I want to understand more about why Japanese society seems to give rise to this problem, while other countries might have higher rates of eating disorders, say, or self-harm instead. How is it that certain ways of expressing your distress become acceptable in a particular country? To find out more about Japanese society, I've come to meet Yuriko Suzuki, who's a psychiatrist and epidemiologist at the National Institute of Mental Health in Tokyo. Would you like tea or Japanese tea or coffee? Japanese tea, please. So culturally, how would you describe Japanese psychology? Uh, uh, traditionally, uh, Japanese psychology was uh, thought to be like group-oriented or like collectivism. And when we compare the uh, psychology of a Western country, which can be described as individualism, still Japanese do not want to stand out in the group. But uh, I think, especially for like younger generations, they want more and more like individualized or like personalized care or attentions. And so I think we are in the mixed state. And can you see certain aspects of Japanese society that then contribute to hikikomori and, and the way that people are? In terms of hikikomori, uh, second day is how people would think about that person. So Japanese tend to think too much of others, what others would think that person. So would that mean that the hikikomori are worrying about what other people mm -hmm. think of them? They might be worrying about what their uh, school friends think about them or the people yes, in their class. Yes, mm -hmm. and like how other neighbours think about the hikikomori situation. And is this something that would worry the parents as well? Yes, the, the parents who has hikikomori child, they have a problem, but they are worried about how the neighbour would think about the situation. So the parents or that family would not bring the issue to the like, community or the, even the neighbours. Some of these people have mental health problems mm -hmm. and in other countries they might express that in a different way, mm -hmm. not by staying in, so they may go and you know, behave antisocially, whereas here it seems to be staying in that people right, do. Right. What is it about Japan that means that people withdraw socially, that that's, that's how they respond, if you like? I think there is a kind of like a cultural difference in how we react, and especially among young children. And I think in Japan, children internalize the problem. They like withdraw, or they do not express their problem like overtly, like openly. On the other hand, I think uh, like in Western country, they have a more behavioral problem. Like, uh, like violence, and I think that is kind of a different presentation of 
mental problem. And can you see certain aspects of Japanese society that then contribute to hikikomori and, and the way that people are? In terms of hikikomori, I think they, especially among uh, like younger generation, they want to be taken as like a special individual in among the group. And, but at the same time, they do not want to, again, stand out in the community or group uh, which they belong to. It's Sunday afternoon in Tokyo's famous Yoyogi Park, where Elvis impersonators and huskies dressed in kimonos pose for photographs for bemused tourists. Groups of young people are playing ball games, practicing complex choreographed dance routines, or just hanging out. They seem to be having fun, and it's hard to imagine that meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of others are shut up in their rooms, talking to no one. I'm beginning to build up a picture of what it's like for these young people and for their long-suffering parents. But having studied psychology in the West, I inevitably find myself trying to work out how to classify these symptoms. Is this depression or perhaps agoraphobia or social phobia? Or is it the case that some people withdraw and then develop mental health problems? Kasahiko Saito is director of psychiatry at Konodai Hospital. I want to know how he'd explain it. Is it sometimes caused by a pre-existing mental health problem? Problem, mm. and sometimes caused by by other things is it some mm. kind of rebellion is it that people are unhappy and this is an acceptable way of expressing their distress I would say that a very few cases are due to children rebelling against the society but rather in many cases children are overwhelmed by the society in that situation they become fearful and anxious, and they become uh, hikikomori. As for the relationship between hikikomori and uh, mental illness, they can become hikikomori because of mental illness or become mentally ill because of hikikomori. But for us, whether it is a primary factor or a secondary factor is not a serious problem. Laza, it gives us a hint for supporting the patient. Is there any controversy about how to treat hikikomori? I know you send counsellors to people's homes. How unusual is that? Until now, there was no typical best practice. We know that wait and see does not work. Nowadays, it recognised. Uh, there is a more positive approach needed. Sending counselors to the house is a meaningful thing. But if you don't prepare enough or are not careful enough, it can cause an accident. So if counseling goes wrong in a home, it can lead to an accident. So what sorts of accidents? Having proper preparation is very important. We should understand what the family wants from the outreach, for example. Also, the hikikomori person must know that a counselor is coming. We need to understand the background of the family and the characteristic of the uh, mental disease the person has. All this information should be gathered carefully and in advance so as to choose the best way to treat the patient. In many cases, the patient becomes violent towards the staff who are the parents in front of the counselors or after the counselors have left. So we have to be prepared for that as well. I'm, I'm, I'm Ling. Back at the Abasho, a volunteer called Ling shows me into the Abasho room. It's a safe place where the young people can start to reintroduce themselves into society. I've come into the room now and there's about um, 
eight or nine people here and there's, a, there's sofas around in a U shape there's lots of snacks that people have been eating on the table it's, it's got a very friendly atmosphere and there are people doing some work they're doing some, some light work um, sort of stuffing envelopes there's a, a computer uh, with the internet there's a TV and there are posters on the wall and it, it feels like a very friendly place it's run by KHJ, the National Alliance of Families of Hikikomori. They work with parents and children, but their president, Mrs Keo Akida, says it's essential that parents totally accept their children's troubling behaviour. I know. Most of the kids used to be a good kid, good child. Then they became hikikomori, so parents would think, what uh, on earth happened to our kids? So they tried to, they tried to force them to come out or force to them to work outside. And they try all those things. And maybe kids become violent to them. And finally, they don't just uh, find any other way than uh, talking to um, organisations like us. And do you find that if the parents begin to accept what's happening and they listen to their child and they try to understand them, does the child gradually get better? That is right. But it's always a difficult thing for parents to do. Totally accepting their kids is always a hard thing to do for them. After withdrawing from life for three years, Mr. Koba's son is now living independently. At this group, the slogan is if the parents can change, the children can change. And if the parents realize this, then things can go in a good direction. So what did you do differently in practice to try to help him? Rather than society, I, as a parent, should have accepted my child's demands and the desires when he was very young. That is my regret. Everything I said happened in the past, I have regret, but I don't blame myself. I'm told I should be thankful to my child and the situation that I have now. And Hide now has a part-time job. He says that his parents' acceptance of his condition was a major factor in his recovery. In my case, my parents took the time to understand the hikikomori situation. They recognized that this type of thing can happen. And also, they thought about their way of life in the past and in the future. We talk about it and think about it together. And I think my parents are now going in a good direction. I think that before, even though they were out working, their mental attitude was just like hikikomori. But now they are more open and honest to themselves. So as their child, I'm very happy to see them change. Toshi also works part-time, but with a diagnosis of depression, he's cautious when I ask him whether he thinks he's fully recovered. I feel like I'm walking on the wall. The upside is that I have work, but it's still hard. It would be easy to drop out of my work and go back to the old situation if I just fall off the wall. That's how I feel now. And I never feel that I can live like other people do. I am walking on the edge, and I always feel I could go back to the hikikomori situation at any time. So it sounds as though hikikomori isn't exactly a condition, but more a way of behaving. It can sometimes be the result of a mental health problem, but after people have been withdrawn for some time, not surprisingly, it can also cause one. The young people I've met undoubtedly have been very distressed. So perhaps in Japan, exiling yourself from society has become the acceptable way of expressing that distress, while in other countries it might be something different. For some, like this mother, Yoshiko, the long-term effects can be devastating. Her son is now in his 50s, and three decades on, he's still hikikomori, and they're both living with the consequences. A few ten years uh, ago, he sometimes went out for shopping, but these days, uh, honestly speaking, there is no need for him to go out to do the shopping because you can shop on the internet. 
I think my son is losing uh, power or desire to do what he wants to do. Maybe he used to have something he wanted to do, but I think I ruined it. So now he, he doesn't have power to do so. Maybe this is the right way of seeing his situation now. But I would say I don't think he thinks his life is full of frustration. So for Yoshiko's son, Hikikomori seems unending. This is the last in this series of The Truth About Mental Health. The producer was Geraldine Fitzgerald. I'm on Twitter at Claudia Hammond. Yoshiko waits to see what happens. But for some, like Matsu, things are looking up. On the very day I met him, he confessed he'd been for an interview for a job as a computer programmer. I asked him how he got on. I'm going to work at the company now, and I'll be doing computer programming there. So finally I got my ideal job. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> what, what difference will that make for you now that you can finally do what you want to do? I feel that I'm finally back on track and supported by this place and Mr. Miyake, I can do this. It's not a full-time job. I'll see how capable I am and whether I can earn my living and how I'll get on practically. I don't know yet. This programme was produced in collaboration with The Open University and you can find the whole series at bbcworldservice.com slash mental health.